to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the young gospel preacher Timothy, the aged evangelist Paul said, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing, you'll save both yourself and all those who hear you. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 16. We welcome you to our final study in the life and work of a gospel preacher. As always, we encourage you to locate your Bible and let's study together as we think about this good subject. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. What is a gospel preacher really like? In our previous lesson, we noted some of the principles Paul laid out in his address to the Ephesian elders. Today, we continue with that idea, identifying what makes a good evangelist, a good preacher of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we begin with this very important principle. Gospel preachers must realize, don't let the trials and tribulations we face Keep us from preaching the gospel. Listen to Acts 20, verse 24. Paul has talked about some of the things he's dealt with, some of the persecution that's going on. And, and as he thinks about that, here's what he says. He says, but none of these things move me. What do you mean, Paul? I'm not giving up on Christ because of them. I'm not going to quit preaching the gospel. I'm not going to say it's too much. I'm throwing in the towel. None of these things move me. Move you away from what, Paul? From standing foursquare for Jesus? From proclaiming with boldness Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? From standing up to error? From preaching to the Jews that no longer the law of Moses, but it's through Christ you can be saved? Paul says, I don't care what happens to me. I'm not going to move away from teaching Jesus as the truth and the only way of salvation. Friend, regardless of what happens to us, we may be mocked. Don't get me wrong. People are going to... You stand up and preach the truth on certain things, people are going to make fun of you. They're going to say your, your, your way is outdated. They're going to say that's no longer up to date. You're go, they're going to say that's crazy. They're going to say that's wrong. If you stand up and preach the truth, you may be mocked for preaching that. Worse may even happen. There may come a point in time where we face physical persecution. It may come a point in time in our country if things continue at the rate down the path they're going now where we actually have to face prison time for preaching the truth about Jesus and God's principles about morals. How should I look at all that? None of these things move me. In essence, so what? If that happens, 
I'm going to keep preaching and keep doing what I'm preaching and doing. Let me share with you a passage in which Paul really illustrated this idea. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to listen to what Paul said in verse number 16. Paul said, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Why is it that Paul could say none of these things move me? Paul said, in essence, woe is me if I preach it not. I'm not going to give up preaching it. I need to consider what will happen if I don't preach it. As a Christian, I have been commissioned to tell others about Jesus. Now, let's say I get in a difficult situation. Let's say I know if I say this, persecution is coming, and I, because of cowardice, I don't say it. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Hey, I'm way more, don't take this the wrong way. But I am way more respectful and fearful of God than I am of anything men could do to me. And so we think about the power of God and the blessing of preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's not let tribulation and trials keep us from preaching that. Second principle we want to emphasize today is that as a gospel preacher, as an evangelist, we must never value the physical and the worldly things of this day over the spiritual and important things of this life. Let me illustrate it this way. Paul says again in Acts 20, verse 24, None of these things move me. Now listen to this. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. Paul did not value the physical over the spiritual. Now friend, I'll assure you Paul meant exactly what he said, and his life was proof of that. Paul was imprisoned. He was beaten, he was stoned, he was uh, shipwrecked in the sea, he was even willing to go all the way to the Roman Caesar himself and, and stand and give him a defense of Christianity. He didn't care whether his head was taken off. He didn't care whether he was stoned or beaten or even had to face death. Paul didn't value the physical and the worldly over the spiritual and the really important matters of this life. Now, let me illustrate it another way. In Philippians chapter 1, about verses 19 through 22, the Apostle Paul will say, I'm in a rock and a hard place in essence. I'm caught between the two. He said, here's what I'm in between. He said, I desire to be in part, I desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better, but to stay with you is more helpful. He said, I really can't tell exactly what's going to happen, but I know this. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Friend, as a gospel preacher, as an evangelist, and really as any Christian, we've got to realize the physical and the fleshly must never take precedence over the spiritual matters of this life that are so important. And you know, the sad thing is, sometimes for all of us it does. Sometimes we let, you know, things of this world, the, the allurements, the attractions, the desires, the things that are so much fun, the fleshly lust sometimes, sometimes we let those become our focus. We've got to realize what's really, really important in this life. Now, here are two questions I think that will really help us, that will really help us set our house in order. I want you to listen to Jesus' words in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. Here's two rhetorical questions he asked. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You ever stopped and really analyzed those questions? What's it going to profit a man? He gains the whole world and loses his soul. In essence, let's say you had the, the wealth of, you know, whoever, Bill Gates and Ross Perot combined. And on the judgment day, you heard these words. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. What would all that wealth really matter at that moment in time. At that second, when God said, depart from me and you are ushered into eternal fire in hell, how much would that wealth and stuff and junk matter at that moment in time? Or, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's say you'll get to the judgment scene of God and maybe you've not lived or I've not lived like we ought to. And God says to us, you know, you, you didn't live this way, you didn't obey the gospel, or you didn't stay faithful. And you say, but, you know, God, hold on just a minute now. I've got all this gold back here, I could trade you for it. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
The point is, nothing. Our soul, the spiritual, must take precedence over the physical, and especially in the life and work of a gospel preacher. You know, you may not have the nicest things in this life. You may not have the finest home. You may not have the finest cars. You may not have as much stuff as, you know, some people, and, and, and you may. I'm not saying you won't, but in those things in themselves are not wrong, but that's not where our focus needs to be. We need to make sure that we stay focused on the spiritual, not on the physical, which is indeed a challenge. For each and every one of us. The devil and this old world and the temptations of it make it very alluring. And I've got to make sure I keep my priorities right where they need to be. And then as a part of the life and work of a gospel preacher, we must never ever give up on the ministry of the word of Almighty God. Listen to Acts 20 verse 24 again. Why is it that Paul would say, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself? Why did Paul say that? Here's why so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul could say those things because he didn't want to give up on the ministry of the Word and the end result that came with that. Friend, it's the preaching of the gospel that really ought to take precedent. And preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season. And Paul could say all those things because he knew that he was going to have that home in heaven that God had promised him as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so don't give up on the ministry of the Word. Yeah, there may be difficult times. Yeah, there may be challenges. It may not always be easy. People may not stand up for you. You know, you may have to face certain things. But will it be worth it in the end? Friend, it absolutely will. To hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Nothing could compare with that. Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present day. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In Romans chapter 8, that's a beautiful idea where Paul said heaven is really going to be worth it all. Another principle that we want to emphasize about the life and work of a gospel preacher is these people, these ministers, these gospel preachers, those of us who preach the word, we've got to make sure that we're, we're innocent of the souls of all men by teaching the whole counsel of God to them. Now, let me illustrate it this way. Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, Paul says this, Therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Now, friend, I understand as well as you do that people are going to give an account for themselves on the day of judgment. Romans chapter 14, verse number 12, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. But I also realize this, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. James chapter 3, verse number 1. Why are we going to receive a stricter judgment? Because we're proclaiming the word of God. And the way and attitude and means in which we do that will also be brought into effect. Hey, if I know somebody, if I know that I ought to be teaching all this and I only teach parts of it because of the persecution or the pressure that it might bring, can I really say I'm innocent of the blood of all men? Let's illustrate it this way. Do you remember two texts in the book of Ezekiel? You've got it in Ezekiel chapter 3. And in Ezekiel chapter 33, you've got this illustration. And the illustration is a very vivid one. A vivid one. There's a man who's given the position of the watchman. And during a time of, of military conquest and conquering, you have the walled city, and in that city you've got a tower, and there's a man placed in that. His responsibility is to stay up when everybody goes to bed and to watch and make sure that the enemy and their armies aren't approaching. And if they are, he's to ring the bell, everybody wake up, and you can be ready for war. Now, you've got this watchman. Let's say he sees the enemy coming, and he knows there's about to be an attack, and he does nothing. Well, the person, the people who die are going to die in their own sin and iniquity, Ezekiel 33 says. But you know what God said about that watchman? His blood I'll require at your hand. Now, look at the positive side of that. Let's say the watchman's up there. He sees the enemy coming. He rings the bell. He sounds the sound. People still die in their own sin. They're going to give account of their own blood. But the watchman's been freed of that. What's the principle there? If we don't say and preach and teach the whole counsel of God, 
Friend, there'll be a lot of reckoning on the day of judgment we'll have to give an account for. Now, do we do it unkindly? That's not what we're saying. We want to preach the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 15. We want to say with compassion, with kindness, with goodness, and with the right motive and attitude exactly what God wants us to say and speak and to do the totality of that. But friend, if we don't say it, that's when we need to fear. You know, let's say I know somebody. Let's say we're teaching on a subject of marriage and divorce and remarriage. And I know there's a situation where somebody's not in right marriage and that situation begins to play itself over and over in my mind to the point that I'm not willing to say what Jesus taught and said about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. If I don't preach and say that, can I really say I'm innocent of the blood of all men? If I don't say what God has said, have I warned? Have I taught? Have I tried to encourage those who might be in sin? And so the practical applications may be a myriad, but we need to realize that's the responsibility. There may be many ways we can apply this, but the responsibility first and foremost is to be innocent of the blood of all men by proclaiming the whole counsel of Almighty God. Another part of the life and work of a gospel preacher is we must never be covetous for other people's belongings. Listen to what Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse number 33. Paul said very simply, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You know, as we've already mentioned, we have been all blessed by God. And God, here's what God's promised. God's promised to take care of us. We recognize that. Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Now, everybody may not have the same thing. And it's possible that somebody may have something that I think I need or something that I want or maybe even something that I think would make life easier for me. And because they've got that and I don't, it could be easy to begin to get jealous or to begin to be covetous. Why isn't my house that good? Why don't I have a nice car? Why don't I have these things? And it could come to the point where you think, hey, I deserve that and I need that and I want that and, and I ought to be able to get that. Paul didn't feel that way. Paul said, I've coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. A gospel preacher must be careful that he doesn't say to himself, why hasn't God blessed me like so-and-so? Or why hasn't God given me these things? Friend, if we're really serving the Lord, we need to do as Paul did and say, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, let me give you the backdrop to not being covetous. And here's the really the key idea. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to notice what the scripture says in verse number 5 following. The Bible says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For he himself, God himself has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, when you think about that passage, let your life be without covetousness. covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For the Lord has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Here's, the, here's really the emphasis that the Hebrew writer is trying to make. Why is it I must never be covetous of anything anybody else has got? Because I have the one thing that is more important than all else. You know, for a long time, I think I missed the point of that passage, and I think it's this. Christians should never be covetous because they have one thing that is supreme to all else. What do we have? The Lord. And the Lord has said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Therefore, we can boldly say, here's what I've got. Here's what I can say. The Lord's my helper. I'll not fear. What can man do to me? If you've got God, what else can you have? What else can you not have? Maybe it's the right question. If God is for us, who can be against us? With God, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. And so there's no need to get caught up in the, the, the stuff and the, the junk and the things of this life that often have the potential to pull us away from God if we've got God. We've got it all. Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. Let's mention another principle that is identified as part of the life and work of a gospel preacher. 
And it's also found in this address to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse number 34. Paul says to himself as a gospel preacher and all preachers everywhere, really, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Listen to these words. Paul said, yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. What in essence is Paul saying? Paul's saying, I wasn't afraid to work. I wasn't afraid to get my hands dirty. There's a shovel that needs to be picked up and worked with. These hands can do it. There's a hammer that needs to be used. I can do it. He was not afraid to get his hands dirty, whether it meant physical work to support himself or physical work that was required in service to our God. As a Christian, we've got to realize, and as especially gospel preachers, we've got to realize that we shouldn't be lazy. That, you know, work might need to be done, and if there's work that needs to be done, hey, let's do it. I'm here to help. I'm here to serve. I can work just as good as anybody else. Let me get out there and help as well. That's the mindset and the attitude that we ought to have. Listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I want to show you how God feels about the person who is lazy and who really isn't willing to work. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 says this. Paul said, even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If a man or if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. You know, if somebody's hungry, what's the, let me ask you this. What's the cure to hunger? I don't think a lot of people know the answer to that question. What's the cure to hunger? People say, well, the cure to hunger might be government. The cure to hunger might be family. No, you know what the cure to hunger is? Work. A man won't work, neither shall he eat. If you're hungry, get a job. And especially as it relates to the work of a gospel preacher, get your hands dirty. Go out and do the work of God. Get busy. Don't be afraid to help people and do things that might open doors for evangelism. Hey, somebody who's lazy, who wants to be around a person like that? Somebody who's always wanting to bum off of him. You know, I knew a gospel preacher one time who was real bad to to, to want to bum off other people, who was real bad to think people kind of owed him something. He'd go over and show up at people's house wanting a free meal all the time and just kind of think people owed him that. And if somebody's cooking, he'd say, well, I ought to show up and go over and eat because they ought to feed me. Wait a minute now. If you want to eat, work. You know, take care of yourself. Work with your own hands. Don't be lazy and expect that from other people. Do the work of God and stay busy in the kingdom of our God. Just a couple of other things that Paul mentions that are extremely important as it relates to the life and work of a gospel preacher. We mention this. As gospel preachers, we want to be encouragers and strengtheners of those who may be weak in the faith. Just like with the work of an elder, gospel preachers have the ability and privilege to encourage and strengthen those who may be weak in the faith. Paul says in Acts 20 verse 35, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Friend, let's do what we can to to encourage. Hey, there's a whole lot of discouragement in the world. You want to see discouragement, turn the news on today. You know, you don't have to look very far to see a lot of problems, a lot of things are discouraging, a lot of calamity and trouble in the world. As gospel preachers, let's do our best to encourage and to strengthen those who need help. Another principle to notice is we want to realize that as a gospel preacher, we also need to recognize the privilege of being a very giving person. Remember again the words of Jesus in Acts 20 verse 35? He said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You know, as we've said, you may not have every uh, nice thing or every fine thing or everything everybody else has got, but if you've given yourself to the Lord, if you've given yourself to the preaching of the gospel, and you have given your life in the service of the salvation of souls, my friend, what greater reward could there be on the day of judgment than to know that the impact of the preaching of the gospel through you as a human tent, as as an individual, has helped people go to heaven. What a great joy that in of itself would be. And then we mention this, just like with the elders. Gospel preachers need to be men of prayer. Remember what Paul did as he closed with the elders in Ephesus? There on the beach, they knelt down and the Bible says, and when he'd said these things, when he'd said all these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Acts chapter 20, verse 36 You know, when we think about, again, people in the Bible who stand out, those are men and women of prayer. And as we think about gospel preachers, Bible class teachers, evangelists, missionaries, you've got to be a person of prayer. 
Luke 18, 1 said, Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And realize this, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. You know, we don't always know exactly how every situation is going to work out. We might not know how every need is going to be met. We might not know exactly, you know, the wisdom with which we ought to approach something, but here's what we do know. The Bible says we can approach God in prayer, and He can help. Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. First Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. Friend, what we want to close with today is for, for each of us to know this. The God who wrote this Bible cares deeply for me, and He cares deeply for you. He wants you and He wants me to live in heaven with Him for eternity. He wants that so much that He gave His most precious gift, His own Son. The Bible says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Jesus left that beautiful place called heaven, came to this land of sorrow and sin, lived among men, suffered as a man, died as a man, was resurrected, and now is reigning at the right hand of God. And he said this, that each of us who are willing to follow him can have a home in heaven with him. One day, he's coming to claim his own. Are you one of his own? Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? John 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to change your life and repent of things you know are not right and turn to God? Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you, to have your sins washed away, be immersed in water? Acts 2, verse 38. Here's the clarity with which Jesus spoke on the plan of salvation. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we're begging you today, become a Christian. Get your life right so that one day you can live in heaven for all eternity with Almighty God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.